Hello, I am Alicia Johnson Williams, director of the Negro Southern League Museum in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm Roy Wood Jr. from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. The establishment of the Negro Leagues was a significant milestone in American history. Andrew Rube Foster, known as the father of the Negro Leagues, made a remarkable accomplishment on February 13, 1920, when he met in Kansas City, Missouri, with eight African-American baseball team owners and organized the first successful professional Black baseball league. The Negro League captures the world's world-class athletes, both Black and Hispanic, and gave them a chance to do not only what they love, but something that they were very good at during a tumultuous time is that of segregation. That's right, Roy. Negro League teams and players helped to galvanize the need for social change in the world of sports, paving the way for Jackie Robinson and so many others that followed. And I've got to admit, I'm a huge fan of the Negro Leagues. And this is what I think is really understated about the Negro Leagues, is that they played in the summertime in wool. They was fighting <laughs> heat stroke and racism at the same time. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's awesome, Roy. The Negro Leagues has a rich storied history. There are so many people that have fond memories, like yourself, about the Negro Leagues. Tending games, not to mention the vast fan base and following that the teams and players have. Those men and women endured so much for love of the game, all the while providing entertainment and serving as a catalyst for economic growth in cities across the United States. For these reasons and so many more, the Negro Southern League Museum is proud to share in this virtual centennial salute to these men and women in commemoration of the 100th year anniversary of the founding of the Negro Leagues. From 1920, to 2020. There is certainly something to celebrate. Thank you for joining us. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey everyone, it's Mayor Randall Woodfin of Birmingham, Alabama, and I tip my cap to the 100th anniversary of the Negro League Baseball. Birmingham was home to the Birmingham Black Mariners from 1920 to 1960. Birmingham holds a rich history in American history, including Black athlete history. Without the history of Negro League Baseball, our city would not be able to celebrate the success of baseball legends such as Satchel Paige, Willie Mays, Bo Jackson, and so many more. Our hometown Barons team helped open the door for African Americans in not only sports, but so many other industries. I thank the Birmingham Black Barons for their vision, their dedication, and their commitment. They are true game changers. The city of Birmingham will always be appreciative of the opportunities that the Negro League Baseball has provided. And I'm glad that right here, right here in Birmingham, we have the Negro Southern League Museum, a world-class facility where people can touch the past and see the largest collection of original Negro League Baseball artifacts in the country. I thank Negro League Baseball and its players for building a path that has turned dreams into a reality. We salute. My father played in the Negro League and my fondest memories of um, his stories because I wasn't born in the time that he initially started playing. I was born three years later. Um, some of the memories that he talked about was just part of being disciplined. Um, that was one of the sports that he felt like um, he could be disciplined in because as a youth, he was kind of considered one of the trouble teens. Um, he kind of stayed in a lot of trouble. So his punishments was always to go in the backyard and find something to do. And he gained the nickname of stick because he always found a stick and he found something to hit the ball with. So that was kind of one of my fondest memories of him um, just being a part of the Negro League. He was always being granddad to me. So it's like me and my brother, we didn't really grasp the fact of how much of an impact my granddad had with history, but it's like seeing my granddad get his flowers now, it's a beautiful feeling. My great uh, great grandfather, he was a, um, a pastor, one of the big pastors down here. And um, he used to take my granddad to the baseball games when he was like three or four. And my granddad, he fell in love with the game ever, ever since then. He used to uh, 
take his little glove. Once he got about five or six, you know, my granddad used to take him to the um, to the games out in Norfolk. He used to sit by the um, outside of the field and catch the little home run ball. So he told me like that's when the moments where he first uh, grew his love for baseball, and he was just like seeing how much in the black community how everybody came together and like the games used to be packed and they just used to come in and see the players and he was like it was like a wonderful feeling to him just to see that they had an outlet and, and a way to, to kind of make it and take their their mind off the hard times I, I didn't realize how famous my dad was until one day my dad was coming up to the school i went to dumbai elementary school and he was coming to see my teacher, and she got so excited to be able to see somebody famous. So, you know, that was exciting. And I remember one year when I was going to Lawson State Junior College, I was talking to one of my professors, and I said, well, my dad went to Winona High School, and he said, well, who is your dad? And I told him, my dad was Stanley Lee Jones. He played with the Birmingham Black Barons. He was so excited. He remembered my dad, and he was, went to tell other professor, hey, I got Stanley Jones' daughter in my class. First and foremost, it, it was an honor, you know, now in my later years in life, understanding the history of the Negro Leagues and what it meant. You know, as a kid, I can remember, you know, being with my dad and people would stop him and, you know, they would say, hey, young fella, you know who your dad is? And I was like, nah, but because I never saw my dad play any professional sports. But as I got older and started learning about his history with the game and, and sports in general, I was like, wow, man, my dad is really, really somebody. He achieved a lot. And he played in a historic league that, you know, at the time was, you know, not really respected, but it really produced a lot of great baseball players. And, you know, my dad was a part of that. Like I say, once I learned the history. So for me, you know, it's an honor you know, having my dad be a part of the prestigious history of the Negro Leagues. My dad's favorite player was Satchel Paige. And I can remember stories of him telling me about um, them being on the road playing and Satchel Paige didn't show up uh, for the pitchers, um, for the game to be the pitcher. And I can remember him saying that his coach told him, hey, you know, you've got to go in. You know, they always call you little Satchel anyway, and you have the statue of Satchel Paige. And my dad went in to pitch. Um, and I can remember him saying that the first couple of batters that went up, you know, he walked them and this, the crowd was like, you know, screaming, he's a fake, he's a fake. They were throwing things on the field at him. And my dad said he looked around and he said that his momentum got the best of him. And he said, you know, hey, I've got to do this because I don't want to go out as being a fake. And he pitched and struck out the next three batters. And that was kind of his uh, fame uh, that he pitched in Satchel Page's place. Outside of the, the world of baseball, like my granddad, he's one of the most caring and giving people you'll meet. And then like just seeing his love for his city and just the pride of where he comes from, just in a black community, like he's always the type to, to come to practices, speak to the kids, come to schools and just like tell the Negro League story. And like, that's another blessing and just seeing him getting his flowers now, cause it's like, he, he's done so much groundwork, just talking to kids and just going up to different states talking about the Negro League uh, story. And even one, one thing that just struck my mind was like, I know when I was in middle school, when he was a little bit more active, he used to go up to North Dakota because um, he has part Indian in his family. So he used to help with the reservoirs up there and, and um, building homes and, and stuff like that for like the native um, people in uh, North, North Dakota. So like that was another thing that it just, struck me and just like his just given the ability and wanting to help and see others succeed. He was one of the first black to play with the Birmingham White Barrel. Yeah. But I also remember as a child back then that baseball players, they was on bubblegum cards. And I remember my dad being on the card. We didn't know he was gonna be we didn't realize he was famous so we didn't keep the card but I wish I had that <laughs> card now. <laughs> so as far as my dad and, and, you know, a game day, you know, for, for my dad and just hearing the stories from him and some of the players that were on his team and just me personally knowing my dad. My dad was a jokester. My dad, you know, he liked to have fun. He liked to light up the room wherever he was at. 
And just hearing some of my, talking to some of my dad's teammates, one being in particular, uh, Mr. Ernest, big dog fan, you know, they just tell him my dad was silly and he would just really lighten, you know, the the dugout, lighten, lighten up the bus rides and all of that. And like my dad, that was his approach. And he just went out there to have fun and play the game that he loved. And But when it was time to take it serious, you know, he would take it serious and, you know, could be the guy that could lead the team and calm everyone down. So my dad, you know, he just looked at it as an opportunity to, to, to play the game and let me go out here and get my best effort and just, you know, relish this opportunity to play the game that I love. Hearing like game day, how he used to tell me, like he used to get his little five cent crackers or whatever and, and a little banana in the water and then he'd be ready to go. And then it's like, it's, it's just so much, so much history he just has him like even in the uh, Norfolk, Virginia area, he was also known as a, a great football player. Like he holds a record at his former high school for six touchdowns and four extra points. So it's like he, it's, it's so many stories. Like I just. <laughs> so in, at, in Geneva, in New York, when he played his first four years, he did not have a losing season. That was, that was great. But because of the times that it was, even though he was good, he never did make it to the major because of the time. He had some players, uh, players on his team that wasn't as good as him, but they made it to the major because of the times. Of course, you know, the travel and not being able to stay in certain hotels and, you know, having to sleep on the bus. You know, I've heard all of these stories. I've heard a story where, uh, players and teams when they were traveling they would literally stop at the side of the road where they would see a body of water like a lake or a pond or whatever and they would wash their uniforms at a pond or a lake while they're traveling to the next city i can remember my dad's stories about um doing segregation that they had to take the back roads because they weren't allowed to be on you know public streets and stuff because um, at the time Negro Leagues were not favored um, and I can just remember him seeing that there was times that they would stop at the gas stations and people would call other people and tell them that hey you know the Negroes are in town and they would throw things at the bus um, when they would get off to go into the store they would throw things and wouldn't let them in the stores or to use the restroom or what have you and I could name times that he said that you know they would flatten their tires on the buses just so they couldn't get from one game to the next. He told me about times like when they had to get on a bus and when they stopped at restaurants where they could only eat where the blacks and they had to eat separate and then like he just used to tell me like how thankful like some nights it got really crazy in, in some of the states but like they was able to, to get where they needed to go. These players to achieve the things that they did under the circumstances that they did, it's just extremely incredible. Like, I don't think me being a, a, a baseball player coming up and playing sports, I couldn't even fathom those circumstances that these players had to endure. And that alone just makes, you know, the league that they played in and the accomplishments just that more incredible. I can remember um, my dad um, in ways that the uh, Negro League impacted him. He always said that it saved his life um, because at the time he stayed in a lot of trouble and he felt like if he did something to occupy his time that, you know, he had a better chance at it. Um, he always instilled in myself and my brother, I had an older brother, um, and my dad always instilled in us that when you start something to finish it. And that means if you start the first ending, you need to finish the last ending. And that kind of carried us through life, that anything that we start, we put our all into it and we make sure that we finish it. You know, sometimes you're going to win and sometimes you're going to lose. And that's one of the things that he instilled in us. Everything had always reverted back to baseball <laughs> because his biggest thing was is that, you know, um, you're going to need discipline in life. Uh, you need to know that in life, you know, you got to start things and you got to finish them with the same momentum that you started. With this year being the 100 year anniversary of the, the creation of the Negro Leagues, like, I have really, you know, just dove into the history of the Negro Leagues and like hearing these stories, it just motivates me in my current job and position and family 
to just really go out and and and, and give it my 100% effort no matter the situation no matter the circumstances no excuses and just really go out and overperform at whatever I do and then when I do have children like I want to share with them the history of the Negro Leagues and show my kids that if these gentlemen and women can achieve what they achieved during those times the sky's the limit of what you can do. Wow. Can you imagine growing up with a living legend? I bet they have so many more stories to share in addition to what we heard today. We certainly hope that you are enjoying the program as much as we are. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you another team member here at the Negro Southern League we did. Thank you for having me, Alicia. Hi. I'm Sonia Smith, and I serve as the project manager here at the Negro Southern League Museum. While this program commemorates the 100th year anniversary of the Negro Leagues, it is our aim here at the Negro Southern League Museum to salute the men and women of the Negro Leagues every day by telling their stories, teaching their history, and celebrating their contributions to our country for years to come. We strive to continuously engage museum visitors with substantial programming designed to create meaningful experiences for guests of all ages. From thought-provoking lectures to fun, family-friendly events, the Negro Southern League Museum has something we are sure will pique your interest. We like to take a moment to thank our supporters who make it possible for us to be able to provide such programming. Generous gifts from people like you help us to continue doing what we do and moving forward. At this time, I would like to ask for your support. You may do so by either visiting us here in Birmingham or making a financial contribution to the NSLM. You can donate right now by texting NL100 to 44321. We look forward to seeing you here at the Negro Southern League Museum, and we thank you for your support. And don't forget to donate by texting NL100 to 44321. And the fun isn't over yet. Next, we will hear directly from the players themselves. Why don't we begin with you, Sam? And why don't you tell us what was your experience like playing in the Negro Leagues? Well, the Negro Leagues was really my second choice. I thought I was going to be able to play in organized ball, but it was 57 time was running out so I had to I went down to Cincinnati's camp and I met this guy named Bob Mitchell and he was playing with the Monarch and I had about $25 and Bob said come on down to Jacksonville the Monarchs are training in Jacksonville so I got me a $19 one-way ticket we were supposed to play the Jacksonville All-Stars but they showed up with about three players and uh so the Monarchs said I want you to play with uh Jacksonville that was the best thing that happened to me. I played that day and the first time up, I think I got a single and I stole a base. That third time up, I was able to hit a home run. And after the game that night, uh, Dismute said, well, look, we don't have to worry about you beating us again. So he signed me. And uh, I was so glad I didn't know what to do. Hey, Larry, I, I know you caught Satchel Page. What yeah. were some of your greatest memories of playing in the Negro Leagues? Well, I was with the Detroit Stars, and we had the All-Star Game. It's always held in Kaminsky Park in Chicago, Illinois. In the dugout was Jackie Robinson, and I shook his hand, and the next year was 59. We had Satchel Page again. You never saw such a crowd of people. There weren't but four or five teams left in the league. We never did play a team that had black players on it. They were all white, so it'll be black against white. That's interesting. And the ballparks were packed. People were traveling 75 miles to see Satchel Page pitch. Larry, when, when Jackie finally broke the color barrier, what did that mean to you? It mean that I had a chance to move to the white league. I never put the Negro Leagues lower than any league. 
throughout the Negro League, you could put the white man's uniform on any of those teams, and and you never saw such great baseball playing. Am I right, Red? Yes, sir. No doubt about it. Right. No doubt about it. Uh, I wanted to get Reggie involved here. Reggie, so many young African-American athletes, Reggie, they want to play basketball. They want to play football. The return on money is quicker if you can get to the NBA or, or the NFL. W what can we do well, to get more black superstars in Major League Baseball? This is exactly what I'm talking about. First of all, you look at all these uh, 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 camps, they, they call them, what it, that they started in South America and Latin America. You got Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, five states right along the Gulf. Why don't they put some camps there to teach young black kids here how to play baseball? That's a good I, point. I go out to schools and say, so who wants to play baseball? No hands go up. Everybody wants to play basketball, and everybody wants to play football. But this happened quite some time ago when there was a realization that the athletes of color were going to control practically every sport in the country. So they had to reduce the number of athletes of color who were playing. So what did they do? They stopped sponsoring inner city baseball. Yeah, they need to get back to that. There is no question about that. Sam, let me ask you, when you watch the game today, are there any players in today's Major League Baseball that remind you of some of the great athletes that you played against in the Negro Leagues? Yeah, well, it's quite a few play players. Uh, Trout with uh, the Angels, uh, Soto with uh, the Nationals. They've got quite a few players, but the, 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 the game is different now. How so? Uh, the game now is basically based on a home run. See, when we play, we play small ball. They don't do that now. Major League, even Major League players now can't bunt. If we didn't bunt a player who was run on first base and you didn't bunt him down a second, that was a 50 cent fine when I was playing. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, blacks manufactured runs, they call it. Like Maury Wills would walk, steal second. He's on second with nobody out. Jim Gilliam bun him over, hit the ball to the right side. T. Davis pick him up with, a, with an out or, or hit, or get a run in. But that's manufacturing runs. That's the thing uh, that, uh, that, you, that you don't see today. Well, gentlemen, we, uh, we appreciate your insight, your look back at your glory days in the Negro Leagues. And it, it was just wonderful strolling down this little history lane. And I appreciate your time and want you to be well. Well, growing up, I made it a, I played every sport, football, basketball, baseball, and I threw the javelin in track. I just love sports. But baseball, I learned that I could hit a baseball four, five hundred feet. So I got interested in baseball. So I started playing every position on the field, pitcher, catcher and outfielder, and my love fell for baseball, and I wanted to make it my career, and when I got to my senior year in high school, the owner of the Negro League team, the Raleigh Tigers, came to my high school. They got seven of the nine players on my baseball team, and we went back to Raleigh and started playing in the Negro League. We were very talented. We won two state championships and one little league championship. Out of those seven, four signed professional baseball contracts. So we were a very talented young team. I spent one year at Negro League, 1962, with the Raleigh Tigers in North Carolina. After I came back to Macon, Georgia, I was signed by the St. Louis Cardinals organization. They have a great organization. I played St. Louis organization one year. Then they sold my contract to the Kansas City Athletics. But that one year I spent in the Negro League, that was a fun year. 
because I met so many great ball players. When I signed with the Cardinals, they had a great organization. They treated me like a human being. The next year, they sold my contract to the athletics. That's when I start feeling the bad part of baseball. I have never in my life felt so broken hearted until I got drafted to the A's. And I played a whole year. I was the only black on the team in the Kansas City Athletic Organization. I went to pure hell because that means when I'm in the bullpen, I'm sitting there by myself because they hung together. And the thing that they would say, you know, I would hear them, how they ridiculed black. I didn't know that much hate, prejudice, and segregation existed until I got to baseball. Because I grew up in a integrated neighborhood. I was not exposed to all that. I know there are things we couldn't do, but I wasn't exposed to all that segregation and racism until I got to professional baseball. And I look at baseball today. Has it stopped? No. No. If you do it in a inventory of all your Major League Baseball team, count the blacks, count the whites, count the foreign ball players. Here I am in Kansas City A's organization. I'm sitting on the bench, only black guy, but there are four foreign guys sitting next to me. You got to be kidding me. This is my country. They draft me in the army to go fight and die for this country. I help build this country. And you telling me I can't play baseball? It's so stupid, it don't make sense. Why? But those foreign players come over here, none of them was legally in this country. They defected, they came through the swamps, they came on banana boats, but those senators in Washington said, let them play. They let them play. But what they didn't realize was, foreign ball players don't spend no money in this country. They take it back home, take care of their family, take care of their community. If you can just only imagine the thousands and thousands of dollars this country gave away that they wouldn't give the black ball players. That's a lot of money. The things my own teammate was saying to me, the things they were doing, it appears to me they wanted me to give up and go on, but I'm not the kind to give up. I made them send me home. I batted 302. You didn't have a catcher in Kansas City Athletic, the whole organization batted 300 but me. When they took me out behind the plate and put me on the pitching mine, I was undefeated. They saw that I was moving up as a catcher. They took me out from behind the plate and put me on the pitcher's mound. But they didn't know I could pitch too. They gave me two games to pitch. I won both of them. They find out I'm moving up as a pitcher. They took me off the pitcher's mound and put me in right field. They found out I could play right field too. They had to find some way to get rid of me. Every major league team had a rule that they only gonna have two black players. 
Some team did not want a black. Somebody in the organization I went in had to go. No matter what my statistics were, even though they were great, they had to get rid of a black ball player. So they chose me. But they didn't want the responsibility of telling no people in Iowa why you sent him away when I was better than anybody they had on that team. When I was in the Negro League, I played a baseball game against the Birmingham Black Baron. There was a baseball player on there. They called him Piper Davis. And I told him, when I played against him in the Negro League, he was telling me about how much baseball is being played in Birmingham. So I told him, I said, when my baseball career is over, I'm moving to Birmingham. When my career was over, I moved to Birmingham. He gave me a job took me under his arm and see, he had took all the Birmingham Black Baron to the steel plant, stock them, valves and fit it. He wanted to keep them together. And he made me his number one pitcher. And for 10 years, I was the most dominant pitcher in Birmingham. I pitch manager Piper Davis to 10 straight Industrial League Championship. And I have never enjoyed it so than playing with those black parents. Every team, let's say every community in Birmingham had a baseball team. Steel plants, coal mine. Every community had a baseball team. And we played each other. Then the steel plants come along and they changed the name from the YMCA to the Industrial League. Some of the greatest ball players you want to see was in the Industrial League, but they never got the opportunity because they had a limit of how many black ball players. And being as young as I was, I could understand it. Why? And I still ask the question, why? Why is it that baseball was taken over by one race and they call baseball their game and wanted to eliminate the black players? You can't do that. But the museum was one of the best things that could ever happen to Birmingham. Birmingham, no matter how you look at it, is the capital of the South for baseball. Birmingham is the most important city in this country for baseball. The museum, when they put it up, I couldn't believe it. I came through here, my best friend, Dr. Layton Rivera, all these exhibits belong to him. And he chose Birmingham to bring them here and put them up. And he grabbed a hope. I wasn't intending to give him to him. <laughs> he grabbed a hope to some write-ups about me and he wanted to put them in the museum because he said they were phenomenal. You know, they made a nice man. They're going to finally call us a major league organization. That's one step. This is my opinion. They have more steps to take. We lost so much by what they did to us. We lost our career. We lost compensation. Look at the money we lost by them not letting us play. They made an effort to make that step to call us a major league organization. But what about the other steps? I feel that all the major league teams 
to get together and try to compensate the Negro League ball player in this country. There's not many of us left. They took it from us. If you want to do the right thing, give it back to us. Recently, the Negro Southern League Museum had the awesome privilege to work with young people from across our Birmingham community at a three-week summer camp facilitated by Make It Happen Theater Company. During the camp, our youth work with educators and artistic professionals to create a production that introduces viewers to Negro League baseball history. These young people interviewed players, learned about the history, and culminated their experience in a theatrical production entitled Home Plate Heroes. Through this play, written by myself and directed by Mr. Eric Marable, we were able to share an important part of Black history that we don't often learn about, while at the same time paying tribute to the heroes of the Negro Leagues. We were pleased to present this play for free to hundreds of patrons in the Metro Birmingham area. Under the direction of Eric Marable, students created a thoughtful play that included music, poetry, and creativity. While we can't share the play in its entirety with you this evening, we will still want you to experience a taste of what the young people accomplished. Up next is the poem, Hey Bada Bada, as presented here at the Negro Southern League Museum. The Great Depression left a deep impression on the South. Yeah. Although they have much in the way of money organization, we right. had a beautiful game of diamonds and bases. Oh, wow. Say space is trying from zero to heroes with a swing of a bat. My grandma tells me stories about a man named Satch Page. Yeah. He's the yeah. preacher ball as fast as light and sitting hitch and all that running for home in the day. Yes, sir. They invented the all-star game for a man named with a maze. Yeah. 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 Grandma had superheroes just like the Avengers, but they were the color of blackberries and could be any villain the color of chalk. The Birmingham Black Parents, the Atlanta Panthers, the Kansas City Monarchs. But even in those golden days, Grandma's heroes couldn't sit at a lunch counter or sleep at a five-star hotel. They had to drink out of colored water fountains, and the best that they could do was wait for a turn at bat. Don't fight back, boy! Swing back, swing! Strike one, two, three. Black children with wants and dreams have to prove why we are enough or why we deserve to live. Blackfoot slides against field and dirt and sends white anger and rage outbreaks. The mind is an interesting place. Understanding who you are and where you've been, knowing that life for us was a triple play of sadness, hurt, and rage, seeing our tears shed together as one. Don't fight back, boy. Sweet, that sweet. It wasn't enough. Our names were silenced and our words were ignored. The game was about being united, but now we are divided. It is interesting to stop and see how history keep, keeps repeating itself. No matter how many games I win for you, Jackie, no matter how much I persist, Satchel, no matter how fast I throw the ball, Willie, no matter how many times I'm at MVP, you only see me as the most vulnerable player. We have to steal bases just to survive the next inning. Instead of winning, they only see us as victims. But I know I'm not my circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now I know I'm not my struggles. Right. But I'm waiting for that change to come. When they talk, normalize, and discuss all the greatest things we've done. Mm -hmm. My people broke color barriers. My people, the world carries. Our strength is in us and on us. We are living legends. The strength and unity that was in you lives in us every day. We, we will remember that, that you played through it all for the love of the game. My name is Dr. Leighton Ravel. I'm the founder of the Center for Negro League Baseball Research and co-founder of the Negro Southern League Museum, which is in Birmingham, Alabama. One of the questions that we get asked quite often is, uh, Dr. Ravel, why did you build a museum, Negro League Baseball Museum in Birmingham, Alabama? And quite honestly, if you looked at all the cities around the United States, Birmingham was the most logical choice for several reasons. Number one, the Birmingham Black Barons who played in the Negro National League, Negro Southern League, Negro American League, are the long, were the longest running professional Negro League baseball team in the history of black baseball in America. 
Number two, we still have Rickwood Field that's a living museum here in the city of Birmingham. And that was the home field for the Birmingham Black Barons during most of their career. And the fans can still visit it today. It's the oldest baseball park in the United States. Number three, we currently have more former Negro League baseball players living in Birmingham than anywhere else in the United States. And then fourthly, uh, we had the Birmingham Industrial League which uh, started back before there was actual a Negro National League or a Negro Southern League. And more players came to Negro League Baseball through the, the Birmingham Industrial League. And a large number of them played industrial baseball and that after their playing careers have, have ended. Um, one of the reasons we're getting together today is to celebrate the, the anniversary of Negro League Baseball in the United States. Um, Last year was recognized as the 100th anniversary of Negro League Baseball in the United States. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes today and kind of give you a little background as to how professional black baseball started in America, because it had, things got started a lot uh, long before 1920 when Rube Foster founded the Negro National League. We can trace Negro League Baseball history from a professional standpoint back to 1885. And that's when the Cuban Giants were formed at the Argyle Hotel in Babylon, New York, and went on their first barnstorming tour as a professional black baseball team. Um, after the, the Cuban Giants were formed, a large number of other teams were put together all over the United States. And in 1887, there was the first attempt to establish a formal professional black baseball league in the United States. Unfortunately, it was underfunded. Um, it, it only lasted 13 games before the whole league, the whole league um, disbanded. Um, in the Birmingham area, we can trace professional black baseball back to 1897 when the Southern Colored League was formed and Birmingham had a team in that league, the Birmingham Unions. And short-lived league um, ran into a lot of management financial problems and um, it only, it, they lasted only one season. Um, the most important factor for professional uh, black baseball in Birmingham was when um, C.I. Taylor, Charles Isham Taylor, moved to Birmingham and formed the Birmingham Giants. And the Birmingham Giants were an incredibly strong team. It was a professional team. Um, on that team, the, there were the four Isham brothers that played, um, Candy Jim Taylor, um, Johnny Steelarm Taylor, Ben Taylor, and C.I. Taylor played also. And uh, they started in Birmingham in 1904, um, and by 1907, they were considered the colored uh, baseball, black baseball champions of the South. And um, during this period of time, as I said, there were uh, black professional teams all over the United States. And the real impetus of, of Negro League Baseball um, came from two individuals, came from Rube Foster and Frank Perdue. Um, everybody remembers uh, Rube Foster because in February of 1920, he formed the Negro National League. He brought the, some of the top baseball teams from the West together in Kansas City, Missouri at the YMCA, and the Negro National League was formed. What a lot of people don't know is that two weeks later, Frank Perdue from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, was instrumental in forming the Negro Southern League. And um, the Negro Southern League was comprised of the top black baseball teams from the South. And um, that was considered, they were considered the highest level of professional baseball in the South. In 1919, uh, Frank Perdue formed the Birmingham Black Barons, sometimes referred to as the Birmingham Stars in the media. When the Negro Southern League was formed in 1920, the uh, Frank Produce team entered the league, and over the course from 1920 to 1963, the Birmingham Black Barons would play in the Negro Southern League, they'd play in the Negro National League, and they would play in the Negro American League. 
and they had their um, the last season of the Neg- of Negro League Baseball ended up being 1963, and. That's one of the things that the Negro Southern League Museum that we do is we look at preserving the history of Negro League Baseball. Um, the, the important components of the museum are we're the largest African American sports museum in the country, and we also tell a national story from a local perspective. So when folks visit the museum, they can un- they can understand the history of black baseball in America through the eyes of Birmingham, Alabama. I thank you for the for the opportunity to kind of share a few things in the background of uh, Negro League Baseball. We are at Sloss Furnace's National Historic Landmark, which is really the only 20th century blast furnace site in the United States that has been recreated as a museum. So uh, it's a very interesting place that we have here. And I'm the education coordinator here at the site, which basically means I handle all the education aspects of the site, anything that has to do with the teaching or learning about the site. So Sloss Furnaces, as well as a lot of the other industries around Birmingham, have a very interesting relationship uh, with the Negro Southern League and of course the Negro Southern League Museum. The way that they are connected is through the Industrial Baseball League, which is a league that was created by these industries to have baseball teams to play each other. So for instance, the Sloss team would play the Avondale Mills team and then so on and so forth. So it was like this other league that was kind of like a minor, minor league. So the reason why they created the league, the companies created the league, was to harbor some sort of company pride inside of the workers because turnover was incredibly high in a lot of these industries because of how difficult the job was. So in order to combat the turnover, this was one way they tried to do that. By instilling this sort of pride in the company, they hoped that by supporting the Sloss team, the Sloss baseball team, they would then want to continue to work at Sloss and have some sort of pride for the company. But it grew to become this very impressive league in the sense of not only the skill, but how many people would come out to view these games. They would constantly have between five and 15,000 people come out to see every single one of these games. And there were several players who went on to get contracts in the Negro Southern League and other leagues around the country. So a very Im- impressive league that it ended up becoming. So Sloss as a company, of course, was just one small piece to the larger industrial baseball league picture. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say that Sloss as a company may played in a very important role in what's going on in the New York Southern League and Major League Baseball. But as part of that industrial baseball league, it ended up playing a very important role out even outside of baseball. Because many of these industrial league games were some of the only times that you have an integrated viewing experience of a sporting event in the South. Because of course, this was before Jackie Robinson, before the integration of baseball. So all of these industrial leagues, they had a white team and they had a black team. But no matter who was playing at a time, if the Sloss team was playing, the Sloss workers would go and support that team, no matter who it was. So it was a very interesting importance of the league itself when it comes to not only baseball, but then uh, what's going on outside of baseball. Now, when it comes to baseball, of course, this became a little bit of a, a, if you want to say, a growing league in the sense of growing talent. A lot of these teams, a lot of these industries, that you'd have to work for the company in order to play for their baseball team. And it became so competitive over the years that a lot of these t- companies would hire out good baseball players. And they, the players wouldn't necessarily work at the company, but they'd be on their payroll so they could play for the baseball team. And it became this com- very competitive league where scouts would, from the major leagues would constantly be here to see how, what kind of talent was going on in these industrial baseball leagues. So interesting thing about industry in Birmingham is 70 to 80 percent of the workforce in Birmingham was African-American. And so that means as you start seeing Jim Crow and segregation practices taking place at these industrial companies and these locations, that means that the companies cannot truly segregate a site because so, for instance, at Sloss Furnaces, we have two furnaces. You can't have 70 to 80 percent of your workforce working one furnace, leaving only 20 to 30 percent working the other furnace. So the men would work alongside each other throughout the day. 
Now, that being said, there was a lot of segregation practices going on uh, within the company as well, such as separate bathhouses, separate areas for them to punch in and out of work, separate company picnics, and so on and so forth. But on the actual day of work, men would be working right alongside each other. And in many cases with this kind of industry, with how dangerous this job was, and very little, especially government protections, and unions were very weak at the very beginning. So the only way for these men to stay safe would be to look out for each other. This idea that I watch your back, you watch my back, we all go home alive. Which fostered, a, at least at a minimum, a sort of family feel amongst these workers, at least a, at the bare minimum. And this, we can see this transition into that baseball league, the industrial baseball league, because um, again, no matter who was playing, the workers came out to support them because those are the workers that are working right alongside them. Those are the workers that are working to help keep them safe. So in a small way, this was an interesting shift in at least when it comes to, again, that, that integrated viewing experience of a baseball or of a sporting event in the industrial baseball league. So. Um, at a small moment in time, this may have been one of those moments that at least would bring forward a little bit, one little step forward when it comes to this. But again, the work was far from being over at this point. So when people come out on a tour to Celeste Furnaces, they learn, of course, how the furnaces operated, the working conditions of the furnaces, and the story of the men that worked the furnaces. And it's impossible to tell the story of the men that worked the furnaces without telling the entire worker experience, which includes the segregation practices, which includes the, the pay, the dangerous working environments, the difficulties of working at a place like this. And of course, that includes the aspects that the company created in order to try to encourage men to work for the company, which baseball plays a huge part of. So on almost every tour that people come to take at Sloss, at least when it comes to a, getting a tour from a tour guide, uh, a docent, at the museum, we include that those aspects of the worker experience that weren't necessarily taking place at Sloss. For instance, the baseball, industrial baseball league, and as well as the Sloss quarters and the housing communities that the industrial companies created next to their sites throughout Birmingham. And these industrial baseball leagues play a very interesting role, again, because it showcases how the company was trying to find ways to, to increase worker turnout throughout the day by trying to incorporate an aspect of life that normally wouldn't be associated. And, and that's something that's very interesting in our city in Birmingham, is that all the histories connect. So industry connects to baseball, which connects to civil rights, which connects to the Vulcan statue, which connects to all aspects of Birmingham history. They're all connected. It's not separate histories. We don't have an industrial history. We don't have a baseball history. We don't have a civil rights history. They're all connected in some way or another. And that's one thing that I love about the city is how connected they are. And so it, it makes it very easy for a tour guide or a docent here at Sloss to connect baseball with, with Sloss here at, at this, in this industry, in this furnace company. I played for the Alden Clippers. I started playing with a Clipper in 19, in uh, 71. And I left there and went over to Stockholm Bab and Fitting and I started managing the team. But I had played elsewhere before I went to uh, Alden. I went to Alden because of lots of my high school teammates and classmates was playing there. And I managed Stockholm Bear for four years. And in, out of the four years, I had two championship teams. Well, when I went to uh, high school, a uh, lot of the industrial league was uh, going to GI school there, and some of the uh, veterans had played in the Negro League. And uh, they used to come out and help us with practice uh, in high school. And that inspired me to want to play. And uh, I did. Uh, the first team that I played for was the Newcastle uh, Red Sox. Uh, I played with the Red Sox for about six years. It was just an honor in, to play in the uh, uh, Industrial League because you had so much talent. If you could play in the industrial league, you probably could play anywhere. And when I broke in, we had people like Reverend Greason, 
uh, he's still around. He's 96 years old. And uh, we had Bo Jackson, uncle playing in that, in that league, B.G. Steven. He was some kind of a pitcher. And Reverend Greason also was a top line pitcher. Oh, there's no comparison. Now, when we were coming along, hustle was the name of the game. If you didn't hit the ball but six inches, you had to run. But today, if some of them, if they won't hit it at the ballpark, they uh, lolly jog on first base. When I was playing for the Alden Clippers, uh, we were playing a Sunday afternoon game down the Bessemer, and B.G. Stephen was pitching, and he worked for Pullman Standard, who made boxcars. And the ball game was getting late, and B.G. was pitching. He says, uh, he said to me, I'm going to end this ball game. He came to the plate, and he hit the ball, and he went out of sight. And B.J. come back, when he rounded the bases, he said, I told you I was going to end it. He could hit just as well as he could pitching. The men and women of the Negro Leagues were gifted and determined businessmen and athletes who endured racial discrimination while demonstrating exceptional talent and sportsmanship. From country music legend Charlie Pride, who was traded to the Birmingham Black Barons in 1954 in exchange for a team bus, to Ruth Foster, Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, Mamie Peanut Johnson, Cool Papa Bell, Hank Aaron, to Jackie Robinson, and on and on and on, we salute them all, every single one. They loved baseball and we loved them. They entertained us. They taught us what it meant to work hard and play hard, literally. Recently, Major League Baseball announced that the Negro Leagues will elevate to Major League status, a worthy determination for which we are all very proud. Thank you for sharing in this commemorative salute celebrating the 100 year anniversary of the Negro Leagues. I hope you've enjoyed this evening's program as much as I have. Help us to continue to do what we do by making a financial donation. Text NL100 to 44321 to give now. From the city of Birmingham's mayor's office, our Negro Leagues players, the staff here at the Negro Southern League Museum, thank you and we hope to see you soon. <laughs>